In this video, we're going to review Cartesian and polar coordinates in two dimensions, and also introduce basis vectors in each coordinate system. So in front of us here, we can see a painting that's living on a flat two-dimensional plane. This two-dimensional space is completely physical, and all the shapes, lines, and curves exist physically, independent of any coordinate system. Now, we can see all these geometrical objects in front of us, but it can be difficult to say anything interesting about these geometrical objects without using numbers in some way. And this is where coordinate systems come in. Coordinate systems are like little grids that we put over top of a geometrical space so that we can calculate things like the distance between two points or getting the length of a curve. The two most common coordinate systems for the flat two-dimensional plane are the Cartesian coordinate system and the polar coordinate system. With the Cartesian system, we use the coordinates x and y to measure the horizontal and vertical positions of a point relative to a special origin point. With the polar coordinates, we use the coordinates lowercase r and theta, which represents a point's radius from the origin and the angle of counterclockwise rotation of the point from a horizontal axis. So you might wonder why we go through the trouble of inventing different coordinate systems at all. After all, the Cartesian system looks pretty simple, why don't we just use that for everything? So there's two reasons for inventing multiple coordinate systems. The first reason is that some problems are easier to solve in certain coordinate systems. For example, a problem of a ball being thrown up and falling down is easier to solve in the Cartesian coordinate system since some of the coordinate lines are aligned with the up and down motion of the ball. On the other hand, the problem of an object orbiting the Earth in a circular path will be easier to solve in the polar coordinates since some of the coordinate curves are also circular. The second reason why it's important to understand different coordinate systems is because coordinate systems are invented by humans, and the laws of physics that describe real physical objects shouldn't depend on things that were invented by humans. So when studying the laws of physics, we need to make sure that the physical laws we come up with work in all coordinate systems, or else they wouldn't make much sense. So we have our two-dimensional Cartesian and polar coordinate systems, and the first step we need to take is to be able to express point P in both coordinate systems and be able to convert between xy coordinates and r theta coordinates easily. So to get the xy coordinates, we simply take this point P and form this triangle here with the origin, and measure the lengths of the horizontal and vertical sides of the triangle using the coordinate lines. And in this case, we get x is equal to 1, and y is equal to the square root of 3. With polar coordinates, to get the r theta coordinates, we use the same triangle, but instead we use the length of the hypotenuse to get the radius little r, and we get the angle of counterclockwise rotation theta from this angle here. So in this case we get a radius of 2 and an angle of pi over 3, or 60 degrees. So we know how to measure points in each coordinate system using the coordinate lines as measuring sticks, but consider this problem. Given a point with known coordinates and polar coordinates, how can we get the corresponding Cartesian coordinates? Well, the answer is to use this triangle again. This triangle illustrates the relationships between x, y, r, and theta. We know that cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse, so that means cosine theta is equal to x over r. In other words, x is equal to r times cos theta. Similarly, sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, so that means that sine theta is equal to y over r, or in other words, y is equal to r times sine theta. So these two equations help us convert from polar coordinates, the r theta coordinates, into Cartesian xy coordinates. But what about the other direction, from Cartesian to polar? Well, in this case, we know from Pythagoras' theorem for right angle triangles that x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. So that means that r is equal to the positive square root of x squared plus y squared. Also, we know that tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. So that means that tan theta is equal to y over x. Or in other words, theta is equal to arctan y over x, where arctan is the inverse function of tangent. So these equations help us convert from Cartesian xy coordinates into the polar r theta coordinates. So we're able to convert between the Cartesian and polar coordinates of a point. The next question to ask is, how do we define basis vectors in Cartesian and polar coordinates? Well, we can answer that by looking at coordinate systems where all the grid lines are parallel, like we did in the Tensors for Beginners series. Here we have two different vector bases for two-dimensional space and their associated coordinate grid lines. 
Now notice if we make the basis vectors disappear but leave the grid lines, we can still figure out what the basis vectors should be. We simply pick a point on the plane and follow one of the coordinate lines and this direction here gives us the E1 basis vector. And following this other coordinate line gives us the direction of the E2 basis vector. And again, following this line over here gives us the direction of the E1 tilde basis vector. And this line gives us the direction of the E2 tilde basis vector. So it turns out that we can use the same reasoning for polar coordinates. Just as we follow the directions of the coordinate lines in Cartesian coordinates to get the EX and EY basis vectors, we can follow this line to get the ER basis vector, and follow this line to get the direction of the E theta basis vector. And notice that since the theta coordinate lines are actually curved, we need to pick the straightest possible direction when moving along the curve. So this would result in a direction given by the vector tangent to the curve. So we can think of basis vectors as being given by the directions we get from following the coordinate curves. Now, in the introduction video of this series, I told you that this symbol here, which you normally think of as a vector, can be reinterpreted in tensor calculus to be a partial derivative. And that might seem strange at first, but I'll show you what I mean. Let's start with a position vector capital R in Cartesian coordinates and put its tip at the coordinates x, y. So when I write this notation here, I just mean a position vector which starts at the origin and ends at the point x, y. Now let's take a second position vector, rh, which is moved by some amount h in the x direction away from r. The change between these two vectors is this blue vector here, rh minus r. Now we can consider the rate of change between rh and r as h goes to zero, and this is basically the partial derivative of the position vector r with respect to the x-coordinate, since h acts like a small step in the x direction. So if we start with h equals 1, then r h minus r is this vector here. And dividing by h is just dividing by 1, so the vector length stays the same. Now if we use h equals 1 half, then r h minus r is this vector, and dividing by h is dividing by 1 half, which is the same thing as multiplying by 2, so it turns out we end up with the same vector of length 1 once again. And using h equals 1 quarter, r h minus r is this vector, and dividing by h equals 1 quarter is like multiplying by 4, and so we end up with this same vector of length 1. And we can continue on with a smaller and smaller h, and it turns out that we get this same vector of length 1 pointing in the x direction for any positive h, and this vector is really just the basis vector in the x direction. So this limit, as h goes to 0, is really equal to this unit vector in the x direction, which is the ex basis vector. So as we can see, this partial derivative of a position vector capital R in the direction of the x-coordinate is, in fact, equal to the ex basis vector. So this might be a strange way of thinking about things, but partial derivatives and vectors are kind of like the same thing. And we can follow a similar line of reasoning with the y-coordinate here. We can start with a position vector r and take a small step in the direction of the y-coordinate, and then take this limit as h approaches 0 to compute the partial derivative, and we can see that the result is the basis vector ey. We can also do this for polar coordinates in the radial direction, which is given by the lowercase r-coordinate, we can take a position vector capital R and take some small step h in the direction of the r coordinate, and then we take the change between r h and r to get this red vector, and taking the limit as h approaches 0, we get the partial derivative with respect to lowercase r, which is equal to the basis vector e r. And what's interesting about the e r basis vector is that it changes direction from point to point in space. Since the r-coordinate lines are always moving outward from the origin, the er basis vector always points away from the origin, meaning that it can point in different directions depending on where we are in the 2D plane. And again, we can do the same thing for the theta coordinate. By moving along the theta coordinate lines, the change is r h minus r, and as we let h go to zero, we get this vector here, which is tangent to the theta coordinate curves. And what's interesting about the e theta vector is that not only does it change direction from point to point, it also changes length. As we move farther away from the origin, a small change in the theta coordinate results in a bigger change of the position vector as capital R moves farther and farther outward.
a lot of textbooks actually go an extra step and force the e theta basis vector to have length 1 by dividing it by little r. But I feel like this is a very artificial choice because it breaks this idea of equating basis vectors with partial derivatives. So as you're watching this video series, keep in mind that your textbooks define the e theta vector differently than I do. So the results that your textbooks give about polar coordinates might look a little different than the results I give because of this factor of the r coordinate. So it turns out that with Cartesian coordinates, the basis vectors ex and ey are constant everywhere in space. But in polar coordinates, the basis vectors er and e theta change direction and length from point to point. So to sum up what we've learned in this video, we've learned the formulas for taking a point on the two-dimensional plane and converting its coordinates between Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates. And we also learned a new interpretation for basis vectors, where we equate basis vectors with partial derivatives of a position vector along the direction of coordinate curves. So after having heard all this, you might feel like this use of partial derivatives as basis vectors is kind of convoluted and silly, but there's actually an extremely good reason for doing things this way, and that's when we figure out the forward and backward transforms between the old basis and the new basis. And I'm going to talk about the forward and backward transforms for polar and Cartesian coordinates in the next video, but in the meantime, try and see if you can guess what the forward transformation might be. And as a hint, I'll let you know that the forward transform is related to the multivariable chain rule.